Good morning. Morena Fano. <sighs> Morena. Thank you for coming. <laughs> We're on day three. Uh, it's been a, a huge, a huge conference. Uh, it's, it was a wonderful night last night. It's an early, um, nice, crisp morning this morning. Uh, I'm very heartened to see everyone um, back in the room, and it's um, wonderful to be here. And thank you very much for that, um, very um, for that warm introduction, uh, Bernie. Uh, I'm here today. I've been asked to talk a bit about uh, about advocacy and. I'm just very aware that I stand on this stage after many, many very, very capable um, advocates and activists um, have have stood here and presented to you. And I want to acknowledge um, all the campaigns, all the work, um, all the leadership that the sector um, has been showing and that many, many people um, who've who've given uh, presentations already have shown. Uh, This uh, this presentation is based on, uh, like all of them, on the idea that there is a shift that's happening. Uh, And there's also a shift that's happening in advocacy uh, in in organisations like Habitat for Humanity and our partner agencies. Uh, And before I go on, I'd like to acknowledge um, my team who are here today, um, Alan Thorpe, our Deputy Chief Executive, our National uh, Campaigns Manager, uh, Ben Ross, uh, uh, Jade Kake from our board, uh, and some of our um, regional managers, if they've managed to make it in this morning, um, Paul Srank and Conrad um, Lapointe, I'd also like to acknowledge, in the spirit of of the shift and in the spirit of this presentation, um, our sector partners that we've been working very closely with lately in advocacy, particularly on a campaign you've probably heard about called Kiwi Buy, um, which we're going to get to. And um, I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of um, of Campbell Roberts um, from the Salvation Army and his Salvation Army colleagues, and the team at Char who've been working alongside us in this particular area. Scott, Chris, Mark, and others, and as our friends at Housing Foundation, Paul um, Gilbert, who's in the room, and Dominic and others. So we, we're working together across our organisations for this co-papa that we think um, is incredibly important. So I want to tell a little bit of a story about what not to do in advocacy. And in terms of this story, I guess I'm telling a bit of a, uh, I'm doing a bit of a reveal about a journey that we've been on at Habitat for Humanity in the past. We've been around for 25 years, we've had a few journeys, and we've made a few shifts. Um, And here's here's part of our learning journey. In the past, for us, we've got this wonderful, um, we've got a wonderful tradition in our organisation. We build houses for whānau, whānau like Tammy, who stood here yesterday and told her story from Rotorua, Um, And at a certain point when um, volunteers and the homeowners have got together and built their home, we have a dedication ceremony. It's a wonderful moment. We we hand over the keys to the house, we cut a ribbon, all the volunteers come in and we celebrate that person. And very often, the local MP will swing by. They'll swing by. There's a ribbon cutting, there's a lot of celebrating, and the local MP will be there. And we meet that decision maker and we have this kind of great feelings. They inevitably give a speech, or it might be the local councillor. Um, They talk about how wonderful we are and how great our work is and how much more of this needs to happen and all those sorts of things. And then we sort of have the sense and these expectations that there's some support there um, from this person who's attended one of these these ceremonies. And 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 then, you know, there might be a policy that's announced, and we're sitting in our office waiting for the cheque to arrive in the mail, like... These guys know us, they know our work, they've talked about it, Uh, they might have gone in the paper with a photograph, clearly um, that's going to work as advocacy. And there's no outcome. (laughs) And so what happens over time is you think, well, wait a minute, what's what's the disconnect here? You know, what's gone wrong? Um, And there's disillusionment and betrayal and there's a sense of frustration and what are these politicians doing? And I thought maybe they just really didn't like us and do they really value us and maybe they don't understand us. And um, and then the tenor of our communications um, with with and to uh, various groups of decision makers starts to reflect that level of frustration, uh, disillusionment, uh, and then ultimately we've got a dysfunctional situation. So this was 
I think this is probably a story that everyone can imagine, everyone can remember some variation on this at some point in time. You've, you've had great feelings, you've had high expectations, you've been disappointed, and then, um, and then, and then you have to shift. So we've, we've certainly been through um, in this process. And so it, got, it made us ask this question, what does grown-up advocacy look like? What does that actually look like? Because, you know, we need to be more um, nuanced, we need to have deeper strategies, um, and we need, to, we need to have expectations that are based on a lot more than um, photo opportunities and the sorts of things that you sometimes get. So we've done some thinking about this and we've come up with a few things that we think advocacy needs to be. And I, I mentioned before, and I will just uh, mention again, ben, Benjamin Ross and my team is the National Campaigns Manager for Habitat for Humanity New Zealand. Um, and, uh, and Ben's also led our team through some very specific methodological work to try and come up with frameworks and approaches that are going to be more effective and impactful. So here are some of the things that, what we think grown-up advocacy looks like. We think it's led by values. And that doesn't change. Our values don't change whether we're in the money or we're out of the money. And our message, to some extent, therefore, doesn't change. Um, critically, it involves listening. So... Sometimes um, what our decision makers and our, our, the, the audience of our advocacy, sometimes they're not telling us about their constraints. And sometimes it's because we don't ask them. Uh, sometimes it's because it's awkward for them to talk about those things. But if we don't listen and understand the constraints that they're working under, it's quite difficult for us to then um, really land our advocacy in the right spot and have impact. Um, we, we're we're goal-oriented with our campaigns. We write our goals down. We set time frames. We're very specific about those goals. Um, one of the things I think that we, we often find when we talk about advocacy is that sometimes we just wish everybody knew who we were. And the real problem here is people don't know about Habitat for Humanity. So if I just do more comms or build my brand, that that's, that's really, really important... And it's not to be confused for advocacy, which is a different thing um, altogether. Um, we, we talk about um, advocacy being political but not partisan. So that's to say that it's a political statement to say everyone deserves a decent place to live, which is our mission and our vision statement. That's a political statement, but that doesn't need to be a partisan or a party political statement. In fact, it's our specific goal to have more and more political parties taking on um, positions that reflect the values and the, the ambitions of our, our work and our sector. Um, and we found that the collaboration piece is absolutely important because when you put values before yourself, and I think this is probably to sum it all up, advocacy has to be lofty. Um, advocacy can't sound like, I want to build my balance sheet. Nobody... Um, Nobody's moved by that. Um, that, is, that is dismissible in an instant as self-interest. Uh, nobody feels any overwhelming need to listen to that. Advocacy has to be, um, has to be based on something that we, is bigger than individuals, it's bigger than our organisations, it stands over time, and it's actually about the people we serve. And they are first, and they are in the middle, and they're last in our advocacy. Of course, there are implications for what our organisations might need. That tends to be the technical footnote to the piece of advocacy, which is actually about the mission, the values, the vision, and the work. So advocacy needs to be pretty lofty and not uh, a wish list of things that I want for my organisation's success. It can't be accused of sounding like that, even where that's legitimate. Um, so I just want to talk a bit about the collaboration piece, and this is our methodology around the collaboration piece. Um, it's to find the coalition that we need to build common ground and then to create that groundswell. And we'll talk a little bit about Kiwi Buy. So Kiwi Buy was primarily led, I mean, there's lots of people that are contributing to the thinking and are part of the conversation here, but there's four organisations um, working. So Habitat, uh, found at the Foundation, uh, 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 the Salvation Army and, and Community Housing Aotearoa, uh, have, so we found the coalition of people who had the, the time, the resources, the will, the opportunity to, to take a very specific goal that we could um, talk about and advance that. 
Um, and, and so that was kind of finding the coalition, and that coalition is growing over time. Um, and then building common ground, and this is really important because Habitat for Humanity has been doing our progressive home ownership model for 25 years, and Housing Foundation, our, 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 our friend and neighbour, has been doing a shared equity program for you know a good long time as well. And we, our programs are different, our infrastructure is different, our branding is different, our networks are different. But what we've done is we've said, what is the co-papa here that's bigger than us that we can stand together on and we can, in a disciplined way, talk about? That's about the people that we are trying to serve collectively. And we've come up with, and alongside the Salvation Army and Char, we've come up with this Kiwi Buy um, concept. We're not saying it's the Habitat model and we're not saying it's the Housing Foundation model. We're saying, here are the essential elements. People on modest incomes deserve a pathway to home ownership. It's, it, it, it's, uh, it's a simple statement of equity. It's a statement of social justice. People should not be excluded from pathway to home ownership uh, because they are on 120% um, of the median income. And you have to be on 200% of the median income to get into home ownership these days. That's not acceptable and we need to do better, and we need, the, we need the models that do that, and here's two examples. So our organisations have become examples and hopefully demonstration plots of what's possible rather than self-advocacy about what, you know, what money we want so that we can do our work. And that's where we've arrived at the Kiwi Buy campaign, which seems to be getting a little bit of, um, of momentum. So... Um, so I guess the test that, we've, that, that I'll offer for you today when you're thinking about your advocacy going forward, and, and I mean, many of you um, could write the book on advocacy, so I certainly don't want to suggest otherwise, but if you're on a journey like we've been, and if you want to join the journey that we're on, um, this idea of, of reasonableness, having the right subtext, being compelling, and acknowledging the other person's context. Here we've found that if we can do these things in our, in our advocacy, it travels a lot further and just travels a lot further and it lands, lands a, lot, a lot further. Nobody wants to read a press release. So we've just had a budget. How much money was there in the budget for community housing providers? Yes. So, <laughs> so, so, so what do we do about that, right? What, what, what is the advocacy response to that? And, and I think that you know, there's no right answer to that question, but we're, we're taking our thinking is that you know, nobody wants to read a press release that sounds like we all just need to go to counselling. <laughs> it's not compelling. So we might, have, we might have 100 legitimate reasons to be angry, but just being the angry lady, I'll, I'll tell you from experience, just being the angry lady turns out not to be all that impactful and it doesn't turn out to be all that compelling, um, and even, when, um, even when that's totally valid. So, so be angry, but then um, if you can sound... Uh, uh, in, the, in the end of the day, the public debate is won by the people who do sound the most reasonable um, very often. Um, now, I'll just put a little, I'll just put a little um, asterisk on that point because there are some people in the room and there have been some people over the course of this um, conference who've talked about issues that are not at, not at the level of what did the chip sector get in the last budget, but are in the level of things that are much, much deeper, deeper injustices in, in New Zealand. And I'm certainly not standing up here saying, you know, don't be angry and please be reasonable, because that would not be appropriate for some of the injustices that need to be fought in this country. But in terms of, you know, this kind of um, question around chip sector advocacy, you know, being reasonable turns out to be really important. The right subtext is again about whether we've got, um, you know, do we just need to educate? Do we need to stand as, a, as an informed commentator and explain to our public or explain to our, our, our audience of decision makers, here's actually the reality for us and we take a tone of educating people? That's often a, a useful subtext. Sometimes the subtext, um, uh, you know, you can imagine a spectrum all the way up to being quite litigious or protesting. And I think it's quite a useful idea to decide before you write your release, before you engage in that piece of communications, uh, before you design your campaign, where on that spectrum you think it's, it's tactical for you to sit and then put that up as a test for yourself when you've finished writing your press release. Maybe this first draft was my own personal counselling. I'm going to put that in the drawer and I'm going to feel better about it because that's what I really wanted to say. Here's the version where I tactically position the subtext so that I, my message travels. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a key piece. 
Compelling is, of course, about getting the right subtext, but then it's about having the story, the statistics, you know, the range of, um, of storytelling uh, uh, techniques pulled together that, um, that can convince somebody. And then also, I think it's always more convincing when we acknowledge the other person's context. So, you know, in our budget release, um, press release this year, we started by noting that, yes, there is a mental health crisis. And we understand that. Because we, what we don't want to be is just one more sector of people who thinks they want more in the budget. Another sector of people who correctly think that they need something else in the budget, along with the teachers and the, you know, all the other groups of people, and people go, well, gosh, you know, it's not raining money, guys. We want people to come out the end and go, gosh, that is, you know, be compelled and convinced because we've acknowledged the other person's context and then we've made our arguments. So those are, that's the test that we, um, we've been running. Um, just, uh, perhaps just a, a last little side note for everyone is um, to talk about Habitat for Humanity's strategy because we are part of a global uh, mission. Um, we've been around the world for 40 years. We came out of the, um, I guess, uh, some of the uh, movement in the American South, Martin Luther King, uh, you know, mixed race communities. Um, uh, Habitat for Humanity grew out of a, a, a belief that we should all be able to live together in peace and safety and um, took some pretty extreme positions in order to show that that should be possible um, and our movement grew globally. We have a new global strategic plan that acknowledges that we aren't going to, we as an organisation aren't going to build our way out of the housing crisis um, around the world um, or in any of our countries and we're not trying to do that. What we're trying to do is scale the impact of our work through um, what we call our three house model. So this is our three house model. The first house is community impact. That's our blue, little blue house and that acknowledges that we are doing projects in the community that are incredibly important and that is a very significant part of our impact. But we can't build back the whole world so we need to work with our sector. Um, we need partners, we need to, to partner to increase shelter access. And there's a couple of pieces to that. There's a market piece, we need to work with our markets and we need to improve how they're working and we need to work with our systems, um, policies uh, and advance access to affordable housing um, and decent housing through those things. And then finally, you can, um, you can work with markets, you can work with um, corporate actors, you can work with governments and you can work with all those people, but at the end of the day, what sits behind them are voters and consumers and, and citizens and people making those decisions. And so there's a, a really important part that we're, we're winning hearts and minds and that we're building um, the society that holds to account governments and that participates as consumers in ways that ultimately help to build that sector impact, that help to build the community impact. So that's our scaling strategy. We try to layer our programming now. Um, not, it's not enough um, to put one more person into a home, although that's vitally important, and every time we hear a story we're very convinced it's a good thing to do, but we have to take that activity and we need to build louder. We need to shout that out. We need to make sure that it has, it's messaged up in a way that we're also addressing the systems and the causes of, um, of the housing crisis that we're trying to address. Thank you very, very much for this opportunity to, um, to address you all. It's been a great privilege to work in the coalition with, um, with Kiwi Build. Uh, sorry. Wash my mouth out, Kiwi. <laughs> Kiwi bye. Um, it's been great, a great privilege to to work with others in the sector, and I think um, I, I'll acknowledge I've learned a lot working with um, with those with those um, boys, um, the, and they and they are. Um, uh, and I think we as a sector are, are growing some momentum around um, perhaps getting some of these other things on the table. Not asking Char to do it, getting alongside Char and doing it together. Um, and I hope that we can build that momentum with more of you and on more campaigns um, into the future. Kia ora. <laughs>